Good evening all. Manoji, I think we can, in the interest of time, we can start the session. We can, we can. Sure. Sure. Good evening all. My name is Prasad Patel. I head the pension and retirement planning initiatives at way to well I welcome you all to the seventh edition of the way to wealth BFSI webinar series and the first one on national pension system. Thank you as always for turning up in good numbers this evening. Uh, we have an interesting topic for today's session. Since its introduction, introduction in 2004, the national pension system, a voluntary defined pen contribution pension scheme has grown in popularity. From 2009 onwards, this was open to all citizens of India in an attempt by the government to create a fully pensioned society in the country. The NPS today is a unique long-term investment for an individual social security and welfare. Apart from its key features, we will also be discussing why NPS is a great retirement tool and how NPS can be benchmarked with some of the other popular retirement products. The NPS is regulated by Pension Fund Regulatory and Development Authority, PFRDA, and we are extremely fortunate that today's speaker is a senior official from the PFRDA. It is my pleasure to introduce Mr. M. G. Monofukon, General Manager, PFRDA, Government of India. Mr. Monofukon has an overall work experience of over two decades, spanning both the government and the private sector. He is presently working as General Manager with PFRDA, and his current assignments include promotion and development of NPS, product design, training, media and public relations, financial literacy, board secretariat, information help desk, and pension advisory committee. During his nine years of tenure at PFRDA, he has gained experiences of fund management by pension funds, valuations, scheme accounting, record keeping operations, and the functioning of the NPS trust where he worked for three years. Prior to joining PFRDA, Mr. Mono worked with IDBI Bank as BGM and with Corporation Bank as a product manager and his banking experience of 12 years are in the areas of credit appraisal, retail assets and liabilities, bank assurance and alternate service delivery channels. He started his career with Nestle India as a sales officer in the year 1998. Mr. Fukon's educational qualifications include an honors degree in commerce, MBA, and CAIIB. Ladies and gentlemen, we will have a Q&A session at the end of this presentation. I encourage all the participants to take advantage of the presence of a senior regulator today by posing your queries via the chat window. Muno Fukon, sir, in all these years that way to Wealth has been associated with NPS, we have found PFRDA to be a very approachable, engaging, and ear to the ground proactive regulator. Your acceptance to preside over today's session as a speaker is another testimony to that. I wholeheartedly welcome you and request you to take over the forum. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Prasad. It's been a pleasure uh, to be part of such a session. In fact, uh, as a regulatory body for promoting pension, uh, such kind of forums, we look forward uh, to disseminate uh, what we have a product like an NPS, which is not as popular as uh, other financial products. In fact, the feedback that we get mostly is that a lack of awareness. And this kind of sessions really help us. In fact, uh, uh, way to wealth is a registered presence for uh, NPS and they have been doing great. Thank and uh, these kinds of sessions really help us in reaching out uh, to large number of uh, people and to create and disseminate what is NPS because uh, when we talk about NPS, we get that feeling that, okay, we didn't knew about all these things. So these kind of sessions uh, really we look forward to also to address and uh, Without much of loss of time, I think I'll just start with because uh, these kind of sessions are very uh, monotonous and I'll try to be uh, um, have a short presentation regarding what uh, about talking about pensions and uh, about NPS. And then we can open up uh, for any uh, questions and answers that, that uh, the 
audience may have so which will be glad to uh, reply and answer for them sure. uh, so i'll just share my screen yes we can see your screen it's visible right yes it is it is thanks so i'll just uh, start with the, uh, the just the basic question of what is retirement and pension so the moment like uh, the common understanding is that uh, once we retire we stop working that's what the common connotation is and the after effect of stopping regular working where we earn a livelihood as that our income stops so this is the consequential effect that you need to have some other source of income to have your livelihood after you stop working and pension as it goes way back in fact it's mostly was available in the government uh, to the employees and which was that's the uh every uh, that's the normal understanding of a person that is that its pension is always available to the government servants or the government uh, employees so when we uh, talk about pensions in india you know we find a definition only in the constitution of india so it defines that it is maybe a contributory it can be a uh, payable on retirement it includes gratuity it can include subscription to a provident fund so here also we don't have a uh, definite word of what and how pension is defined from an employment source or an employer source so it includes a wave lot of things because we have the provident fund of 1925 act so we had a and then it was again uh, we have another act of 1952 also so these were uh, these were available only to the government sector and the government employees so we don't find very much acceptance and popularity of pension down the uh, in a historical uh, employment or in our organized labor force so i'll just uh, take you through two uh, uh, points of a un population report that was published in 2019 so it says that how grave the situation is for pensions and uh, retirements in india just to give a hint of it in the demographic and they have so showed that they have depicted that india will be the most populous country by 20, 2027 that will be will be surpassing china and on top of it what they are, what the depiction is that the people above 60 years of age will be growing drastically so the elderly population in the country which is right now 1 in 10 that is almost uh, 10% that will grow to 20% which means every one of five people in the country will be an elderly will be a senior citizen what that should define and the next thing is related to that is that the elderly population has to be supported by the government and the support comes from the working population so there is a ratio of this basically the elderly population being supported by the working population so that ratio is also go going to increase because of the growing a uh, population or uh, I means the elderly population and their life expectancy becoming more improve in the life expectancy because of the medical and due to quality of life getting better and better so that ratio will be going from around 17% to around 30% by 2050 so there's lot of things to be done in this area of a pension and retirement savings that's what my point on this slide is and this is being evidenced by an un uh, population report next uh, this want to highlight what stage we are in the pension part advanced countries or developed countries that we normally describe they we see that the social security or the social security net that the government provides to the elderly population after you cross a certain age limit you have a subsistence subsistence coming from the government here we don't have such a kind of thing except some few things where uh, you need to be a person or an individual living below the poverty line you have a certain age limit so or you have been under certain economical circumstances for which you have been you may get a state pension and which are very 
nominal, maybe from 200, 500 and 800 to the most. And apart from that, they give you grains for this to have a survival. Basically, it's not that a quality of life that you get. It is just a government scheme which runs, which is a, which is a social security net. For, this is not a complete social security net. You need to qualify on various parameters to have this benefit from the government. And if the, these benefits are very, almost insufficient, basically they are just very small, meet all the needs of a person. So these are the schemes which are being run by the government under um, the state and the cent, uh, central government also, where we, for the below poverty line. So we don't fall or the majority of the people may not fall into this because you need to qualify on various parameters. You have to be 60 years of age, you or me 80 years of age, then you get certain of 500 rupees. So this is just the starting of it. We, we are trying to build up, the government is trying to build up, but we are not being built up on a large scale and we cannot afford to do such a kind of a spending right at this point of time also other schemes that we had was all employer employee related it's all about employment related so we had the civil service pension which was the central government pension which got discontinued from the first of january 2004 and it replaced the nps so there also that was a defined contribution uh, has come into place in spite of a defined benefit which was the existing uh, like when you are working with the government, you get uh, after superannuation at 58 or 60 years of age, you get 50% of your pension, uh, of your last drawn salary. So this also has was has to be discontinued because the liability on the government was too much to bear and going forward, the liability would have been increasing because revenue collections was going more towards pension rather than development work. So going forward, government also realized that this is not a sustainable uh, way of maintaining the finances so they have replaced this defined benefit where the government had to pay from its revenue with a defined contribution where the employees also started contributing and the government also started contributing this is what the system will be talking about much later in this this is uh, the system that was introduced by the government in 2004 and then adopted and extended to all Apart from that, as I told you that the Employees Provident Fund Act was there, 1925, 1952 also it got, was there. So there, these are uh, for the, basically the unorganized uh, labor force or the unorganized workers or the organized workers in the sense uh, that when you have a 20 people working with you in an establishment and the salary is less than 15,000, you are mandatorily, the employer has to mandatorily cover under these schemes. So the contributions is also bifurcated. The act also defines under the EPF Act, the Employees Provident Fund Act and the Employees Pension Scheme Act. So there are two parts to it, wherein 12% is contributed by the employer, 12% is contributed by the employee. This is also a contributory kind of thing, but uh, this is mandatory when, uh, when the salary is less than 15,000 and uh, when uh, the number of employees also is more than 20. So below that, 20 numbers or below above salary of 15,000, there is no mandatory. It's not mandatory for an employer to do it. But they can voluntarily join those schemes. Uh, the, these are called recognized provident funds and or the employer can set up a trust by themselves, offer retail benefit schemes uh, or retail benefits to its employees. So these uh, has, can be floated by the employers. These are and get the, and they can, the commissioner of income tax to get the approval for the tax benefits. So these are known as approved superannuation funds, which the employer sets it up for giving benefits to its employees. And recognized provident funds, again, you have to take an approval from the EPFO to run your own. And special provident funds were also created uh, specifically targeting or sector wise uh, labor force. Coal miners, we had one because uh, in eastern part and uh, the central part of India, you had a lot of uh, coal belts and all. <laughs> so to protect the miners and the workers, uh, this act was passed and you have uh, people contributing it, uh, the employer and the employee also, and that from where they derive a pension. Seamen is there. 
then jammu and kashmir uh, provident fund is there assam tea plantation this is also catering to the tea industry in jammu and kashmir i think it was uh, a separate uh, act for the employees there so these are very specific to uh, specific sectors or industry or to a specific location or to the boundaries of the state recently uh, government has uh, made certain uh, schemes uh, like the atal pension yojana the pradhan mantri shram yogi mandhan or uh, and shram yogi karam yogi so these are nomenclatures uh, to target specific sectors of the society basically traders then you farmers then individuals who are self employed or gig workers which is the uh, latest uh, what do you call a colloquial word that is coming up people are not relying on any employers they are on their own and they move from different sectors to sectors so <clears throat> to guarantee or to look after the pension they have government has also provided incentive to subscribe to the schemes where uh, the government actually guarantees a certain portion of the pension payments after they reach 60 years of age in between the uh, subscriber also contributes the government also co contributes to that scheme then other schemes that are there are public provident fund which is very popular with uh, for us as a tax instrument uh, savings uh, which is voluntary and uh, it can be open so the next uh, hardly uh, people uh, create retirement fund out of it yes but for the purpose of tax saving it has been widely used but uh, officially it is a retirement product basically from the on a voluntary basis which is not mandatory at the employment we have annuity plans from insurance companies and then we have uh, mutual funds also floating some five six schemes uh, from the retirement uh, with the objective of a retirement planning that the scheme prospectus says so these are all the varied uh, retirement planning or the retirement saving schemes that you have at present uh, which i'll be discussing more or focus on the national pension system uh, later part this is what the indian scenario looks like at present and uh, this is not sufficient uh, uh, the savings that are happening in this uh, on, on this scenario or right now the products that we are ha having it right now the savings that is happening into this uh, schemes are not sufficient to cater to what i have shown the elderly population growth that may be happening or that we may be facing in the future because of all our savings only 2.1% of our gross disposable income goes towards pension and provident fund and the entire savings that has happened is around almost around 28 lakh crores which is almost around 10 12 and of our gdp this cannot help us in uh, tackling this uh, situation that we will be facing and another 20 30 years because the epfo we have hardly around 13 lakh crores provident fund only 70000 crores of savings like insurance which i am talking about these are super innovation funds that also been parked there these are all nvt products that are being sold by the, all the insurance companies in india it's only 7 lakh 74000 crores 70 lakh 75000 crores NPS we have five lakh eleven thousand crores. Mutual funds that's around nine thousand and others specific <coughs> uh, schemes of the coal mines and that we are around one lakh twenty thousand crores. So the entire opus put together is not more than thirty lakh crores. So this is not sufficient to support the elderly populations thirty years or twenty years hence. My uh, point, a uh, uh, simple point of. Uh, in this slide out here is that so the next thing is that whether this savings are sufficient to support retired life so what happens so there is a term that we use it as the income replacement rate so whether a person who has been earning and getting used to a certain uh, amount of payment or a regular uh, salary or an inflow the revenue inflow of every month or every year every year annually once it stops working that also stops so after then what is the replacement that would be coming from that how much money you require from once your regular flow stops after you stop working then how much inflows or revenues you need to generate 
from other sources or from your savings support your team standard of living or your quality of life that you have been leading all throughout your 30 years or 20 years of working life so the benchmarks that we have is that in civil service pension as i told you the last drawn salary 50% you get in the government which has been replaced now so people retiring before 2000 uh, means joining before 2004 first of january they are covered under this thing so when they retired they knew that my last drawn salary is 1 lakh i'll get 50000 and my da will also increase it's protected towards inflation that extent so employees the epf for that i talked about yes i have talked about saying that 15000 was 15000 is the maximum limit so the maximum pension a person can draw technically is 7500 but you need to complete 35 years of service which is not very realistic and it's very uh, means only a few are lucky to get that amount it ranges between 8000 to 6000 at the most or 5000 to the most so this whether a person who has been drawing 15000 at the fag end of his career whether a 3000 will be enough for him to sustain it so this is what the replacement rate i'm talking about so you have to compromise on something else basically so superannuation fund is also like an employer employer relationship it depends on the employer what retail benefits he wants to give so the trust decides and accordingly they arrange or Uh, the contributions by the employee and the employer so they keep on adjusting it on they uh, run that scheme in that fashion or new employees contribute towards the old employees uh, it's like a cross subsidization happening because and this does not sustain for a long unless you have fresh recruitments people supporting the you have more people supporting the pensioners so this also sustain in the long run you have to have new people into the system to support the retiring people so once your recruitment stops this also will be facing under pressure and a lot of things we have seen recently because of technology or maybe uh, towards of more of automation we see recruitments coming down maybe centralizations and uh, and these uh, superannuation funds are uh, trying it very hard to sustain themselves so they are also shifting into nps uh, right now and the other use one is a voluntary you decide you plan according to yours uh, what retirement what corpus i require at my age and how will it grow so this building up a retirement corpus is very uh, technical in the sense in that sense you don't because you need to factor in lot of things into it at what rate you have what how much you need to contribute how much the, your investments will grow and how much inflation will eat away your returns so this is a very uh, means uh, professional not a very professional but i just want to say to be very exact exactly i want 50% then it's very professional kind of a calculation you need to do so you need to adjust your contributions you need to adjust your risk profile according to it and all those things and if you have an inadequate corpus of what you intend to make then you will be forced to work longer or you need to reduce your life stay the same quality of life that you enjoy will go for a deterioration so when the corpus is inadequate we should be ready for this two part either we will be forced to work even if you don't like because you need to have certain regular income or you need to compromise on your life stay the next thing if you realize it early then you start saving more so these are the three options that you have <laughs> when you if you realize it early that is better but uh, that you save more and if you realize it later that's very difficult to cope up with your uh, retired life because now if considering life expectancy at around 18 years so you will be uh, leaving 18 years without an income stream means so you have to make your own income stream basically you need to secure your own income stream there's no employer to it so this is a bit challenging and going forward it will be maybe 20 25 years you need to sustain and working for working for 25 years he need to sustain himself by the same period his own so this is the question that arises on how well you have to plan basically your retirement 
this is not our illustration. This is one of the uh, retirement consultants' illustration. That's uh, Willie Star Watson. I was quoting them. Uh, they said, made a calculation and they have made a, uh, assumptions basically a person working around for um, 30 years, starting early salary of uh, at 20, 25, 25 years or 28 years, starting salary when maybe around 30,000 or 25 to 30,000 bracket salary increasing at the rate of 8%. So if he only subscribed to the PF, the EPFO at 12% 12, 12 on his own contribution, including his gratuity coming to that extent. So the replacement work rate works out to 30%. So superannuation, yes, you have a tax benefit for the one and a half lakhs. If, so if he starts contributing one and a half lakhs for the, over the last uh, 25 years of his service, so your replacement imp improves to 46%. And now since uh, NPS has come in, uh, all put together, if you put subscribe to NPS also, again, 10% is that we have, uh, this calculation is done on the basis of 10% of the tax benefit that is there. So the replacement comes to around 63%. So this is what the, this is what kind of uh, decision a person needs to take what kind of money he requires, what kind of replacement he requires, and these are the, all the options that are available, or how much he needs to save. This is just an indicative of that. So coming back to NPS, which I like to share now, is that we have a large number of subscribers and the EUM from the government only, because they are mandatory to join, because uh, central government, as I told, SAD has also told first January 2004 it's mandatory. Anybody joining central government service. So we have central government service, uh, central government employees of around 21 lakhs plus. So their contributions is almost 1 lakh 60,000, 65,000 crores. So they have been contributing regularly at the rate of 14% from the government and 10% from their own side. So this uh, is a regular. Of flow that is coming. State governments have also adopted NPS. So there we have around 49 lakh subscribers. Their corpus is more than the state government because the number of subscribers are more and contributions comes on a regular monthly basis. So there we also we have around 2 lakh 60,000 crores. So 4 lakh 20 odd crores comes from the government and they have around 70 lakh subscribers. What I'm talking about today or stressing more on the private or the voluntary part. Voluntary, we have around um, 13.86 lakh subscribers and corporates where they have an employer-employer relationship, which the employer have voluntarily adopted NPS. They have, we have a subscriber base of around 10 lakhs 55. And that too comprising from 8,000 plus corporates. So 8,000 corporates have now adopted NPS um, as a retail benefit scheme for their employees. Uh, thinking about uh, all the benefits that they have these are with the other uh, retirement benefits. Either they have switched it off because employees usually have a retirement benefit scheme for their employees. And uh, yeah, almost 8,000 8, plus corporates have already shifted to NPS and they com constitute around 10 and a half lakh subscribers and they have contributed around 53 lakhs, 53,000, sorry, 53,000 of corpus. So this is the uh, status of voluntary adoptions around 70,000 crores we have on the voluntary part. Who have adopted NPS and around uh, 24 lakhs plus subscribers. The major portion of our subscribers come from the government scheme, that's subtle pension Yojana, where when we give uh, a guaranteed pension of 1000 to 5000. So that has attracted a lot of people because the government also co contributes towards that and it's a guaranteed return uh, basically to the subscribers. Coming back to NPS, uh, just want to highlight the unique features of it, basically how it scores over or how best it is as a retirement product. So since it's a late entrant uh, to the retirement uh, space, uh, it was realized that the people don't carry forward their uh, pension account. When they change employments and all, there's a lot of uh, difficulties into that. So here, what has been done in NPS is that the pension account is an individual account in the name of the employee or the subscriber in his own name. 
and he can take that number it's a unique unique number so that it can be carried across all employments and if he's on his own also there's no employer the number stands and he can continue so this is the uniqueness of it that it's portable across employment it can be maintained irrespective of the sector you are engaged without an employer whether you are joining on your own self it can be maintained at any cost basically so don't have uh, the number tagged to an employer or you are uh, if you have tagged to an employer also you can remove the tag and uh, maintain the account by your own self other strong feature of data is the lowest cost uh, pension scheme not in india it's one of the lowest scheme pension product of the world in fact the architecture that has been set up uh, helps us to have economies of uh, costing also economies of operations also because all the functioning has been divided into different entities uh, specializing in different activities basically as i told you as a point of presence uh, as a colloquial term is the distribution point so they do the distribution record keepers are different fund managers are different and they charge differently and keeping all this cost together it comes to one of the lowest in fact the fund management cost if you see it's 0.01 whereas the mutual fund industry when you see and uh, it's uncomparable in fact uh, it's not in fact all our cost put together over a 30 year period is 0.02 whereas the total expense ratio in a mutual fund would be around 1.5% or so so we this product has been built and the beauty of it is that the cost doesn't eat away your corpus accumulations basically it helps us to build uh, a larger corpus when compared to any other investment uh, schemes that you put in the other is that you have flexibility of choices of the fund manager and the asset allocation part here you can decide on your own allocation to the equity or corporate bonds or to the government securities this flexibility i'll talk about later but this flexibility of a fund manager or allocation to different asset classes nowhere in the industry mutual funds you have a folio you have a tied up your scheme if you want to in the scheme you need to get out of means you have to redeem the scheme and then subscribe to a new L, new scheme where you have that your desired allocation it's not that for us it's something very unique to us returns yes i'll talk about later this uh, product offers great uh, competitive returns and it's uh, performing very well for the last 12 years uh, it's very uh, tax efficient in the sense that a lot of tax benefits has been given by the government on contributions also on accumulations also it's not uh, taxable and on when you withdraw the fund there are various tax exemptions uh, which are there which will uh, about later part transparent and online yes you can have access we have mobile applications you can see your units you can access your account it's not very uh, it's user friendly and it's very uh, transparent uh, the investment guidelines that we have given to the fund managers also are very transparent and uh, last is that it is uh, regulated uh, by us our pfrd so basically when you start an nps you have uh, pension account that i told you uh, that we call it as a in our in terminology is a tier 1 account so tier 1 account is a pension account which is in the name of the individual and it can be opened uh, with a amount of 500 rupees and uh, the yearly contribution the minimum contribution that is required is 1000 rupees only and there is no maximum limit of the contribution that you can uh, pay to the account it's unlimited but tax benefits as i say it has all the tax benefits so 10% is the um, uh, amount of tax benefit of the basic pay that is being available or 20% of your gross income that is available so this account has all the tax benefit uh, embedded into it the tier 2 something which is can be open when you have only up the pension account it's a investment account or a parking account uh, for your surplus funds it is freely withdrawable you can open it up with a 1000 rupees and then you, you, whenever you wish to con contribute you can do it minimum contribution is only 250 rupees so it is like a savings account only uh, with a certain investment 
uh, options into it and uh, the same cost structure applies to it and uh, it is more of a replacement to the government uh, scheme for the gps so that was the conceptualization of this tier 2 it's open to everybody now so this tier 2 it's more uh, working like a uh, mutual funds also it's basically how that's how it works it's getting unitized and all so uh, this is account doesn't have any restrictions on the withdrawal here in uh, the pension account we have the utilization also we have how when you withdraw what amounts has to go here you, it's not asked for but the only uh, disadvantage is that it doesn't have any tax benefits into it right now except for the central government employees uh, central government employees can put in to the tier 2 get some uh, atc benefit but uh, uh, that should she have a lock in period of three years so for others they it doesn't have any tax benefit onto this account so joining the scheme uh, it has been simplified over over the period uh, in fact uh, anybody who is in the any indian citizen can join in uh, non resident can join in also and oci can also join in the scheme provided he is between uh, a major um, so executed and contract 18 years that is and up to 65 years they can join a few formalities of an application form is there and so i see has to be followed photograph and this proof that is required and we have enabled in our system to receive the forms physically and plus means the physical application form in hard copies and through online modes also so the next phase of this once you join the scheme is the accumulation phase so how your funds accumulate you contribute to the scheme or you contribute to your account basically that's the pension account that you have the contributions can be are accepted in the systems in multiple ways also the subscriber can contribute he can co co contribute along with the employer also so when the employer also contributes both contributes the employee employer and there is no fine percentage of contributions into it so the employer can contribute any percentage of his salary the employee can also it can be unequal equal or any one of them the employer also can contribute on behalf of the employee so we have kept this flexibility the flow of money to the account it can be both the employer and the employee and it can be varied according to the proportions it can be either or also so this goes to the fund manager who invests it and at the end of the day this gets unitized uh, the investments are reflected in unity as like in a mutual fund it's get uh, units are reflected the fund manager declares an nav at the end of the day for the schemes that have been chosen and the contributions get converted into units at the end of the day and this be reflected in the statement or the account statement of the subscriber so these uh, units as and when it's acquired at at the nav on which the uh, funds has been remitted this goes on the value goes on as uh, means increasing the, on the long term it goes increasing so the value that would be declared by the fund manager would ultimately reflect multiplied by the units will reflect the pension corpus so this is how the system works in fact unitization happens with the record keeper the fund manager does the fund management and we have a banker also in between and lastly the nvt service providers will also come into play when you exit the scheme so this is the entire accumulation phase when you go on contributing right towards when uh, during your working life so after joining the contribution starts basically and the frequency can be determined by the subscriber himself he can do it next part is that exit exit when we are talking about is the maturity of the scheme that's a superannuation of the scheme uh when a person superannuates or retires so here we say that in a normal uh, retirement or a normal exit from the scheme 60% is being will be paid as lump sum and 40% of the corpus has to be utilized for purchasing an annuity plan from an insurance company so this will be giving the pension basically the lump sum it can be uh, will be transferred to the bank account and this 40% will go to an insurance company based on the choice exercised by the subscriber 
what kind of uh, pension or the regular income that he wants to have from the insurance company. If the subscriber wishes to withdraw before the superannuation age, maybe superannuation age as 55, 58 or 60, whatever has been there. If he wants to draw before that, then 80% will go towards the insurance company for giving an annuity and only 20% will be paid as lump sum. Here we have some caveats also. If the corpus is 1 lakh and below, then the entire sum is paid because uh, you don't derive a healthy pension uh, with a uh, uh, 20,000 uh, 20, rupees and uh, the minimum um, uh, amount that has to be transferred for annuity is around 50,000. So in the normal retirement also, we say that if the corpus is less than or equal to 2 lakhs, the entire amount is being paid. And in case of unfortunate death, what happens is that the nominee gets the entire corpus and the nominee has also an option to purchase an annuity also. There are two choices into it. But normally people take the entire money also. If the employer feels that no, this cannot be done, uh, the pension has to be given to the family, then this has also to be, uh, can be opted for a pension. Uh, to the insurance company. Uh, the other part is that the, you can also continue this after superannuation also we have options to continue this account till 70 years also. Then you can defer also. There are a lot of options into it but this I'm talking about in the normal circumstances. So you can defer your uh, annuity purchase by three years. You can um, have the lump sum of 60% drawn over a period of 10 years according to your tax planning also. You can do it. Or you can go on contributing till the age of 70 and do the final the withdrawal at the age of 70 also is permitted. Once you extend after 60 also, we can um, uh, exit the system anytime you want. So at the last phase, as I told you, we have annuity service providers uh, around 12 from where you buy the annuity schemes. And uh, as uh, there are seven broad annuity plans which we have, I mean, which the insurance companies offer. Uh, the most popular is the return of capital, the last one. And the first one uh, is where uh, the entire corpus flows to the insurance companies and the insurance companies guarantee a monthly flow of pension. So here you don't get any uh, amount of money back to the nominees or to the legal highest. Here the pension amount is the highest and the last one where you get the return of capital will be the lowest. So these are the choices that needs to be exercised on the exit. So the pension will be coming basically from the money that has been parted from the corpus to the insurance company. A lot of choices to be done. We have two record keepers which have the same standards of services, but they have a cost differentiation. So uh, first choice comes to the record keeper, NSDL and uh, if in tech we have. We have seven fund managers. As I told you that uh, these have a track record uh, when they get registered with us. They have a good track record of fund management. So these also can be changed. Uh, that's all about flexibility. You can change the fund managers once in a year also. So asset allocation uh, can be done actively when you make your own choices according. We have four asset classes. And uh, the subscriber can choose it on his own. What percentage of his contribution should go to which asset class. Equity we permit 75% to the maximum. And alternate assets, we permit 5%, which is the most riskiest asset in this for comparatively to the four asset classes we have. And uh, if a subscriber is risk averse, you can put 100% in the common securities also. So this allocation can also be changed by CNIA. This will have been allowed in the system. So you can change the fund manager once in a year. The asset allocation can be changed. Yes. So you can Evaluate your portfolio if you feel that this portfolio or your risk appetite, it's basically aborting the evaluation and the risk appetite of the subscriber. If subscriber is not very conversant with doing an active choice, we have an auto choice. When I mean, we say that equity exposure will be 75% in aggressive fund and in a conservative fund, the equity exposure is 25%. And in a moderate, we say that it's a 50% equity exposure. So this an aggressive fund of 75% uh, equity, 10% corporate bond and 15% government securities remains. This portion remains constant till the age of 35 years. And in the aggressive fund, what will happen is that the equity proportions will go on decreasing at the rate of 4%. And in the moderate one, it's 2% and the conservative one, the equity goes on decreasing by 1%. So 
So at 55 years of age, what will happen in the aggressive fund is that the equity portion goes to 15%. The moderate has around 10%. And the conservative will have an equity exposure of only 5%. So this you need to rebalance it on a yearly basis, on yearly annual basis. System takes care of it. So the system auto rebalances on the date of the subscriber and the equity exposure goes on decreasing over the period of time. So returns have I told you that uh, it has been, we have an experience of around 12 years. The oldest one is the central government where we, we have an equity exposure of 15%. So that fund has given a return of CAGR of 9.96% over a period of 12 years. So that's what I've told initially that we deliver competitive returns historically. So 9.96% over a period, CAGR of 12%, over a period of 12 years, it's quite commendable on the part of the fund managers that we have. Equity, yes, it's, uh, we have a track. These are all the averages of the seven fund managers that I'm giving you. Equity around 9.71, corporate bond 10.32, and government securities 10.18. So these are the returns that have been delivered by our fund managers following the investment guidelines that has been prescribed to us. Uh, coming to the tax benefits, I told you that uh, there are a lot of tax benefit on contributions. But once uh, the one that I'd like to highlight is that when you subscribe to NPS, 50,000 of additional deduction is given under ATCC D1. So here, this is very unique to this uh, financial product. No other financial product has this kind of a deduction. So when you subscribe to an N to NPS, you can claim a deduction of lakhs. That's as simple as that we can say uh, to that. So this 50,000 is extra to the person subscribing to NPS. Apart from that, 10% uh, of your basic and uh, DAF, uh, whatever you contribute is allowed under ATC, which is, uh, which is normally been exhausted by uh, the salaried or the corporate uh, who have been there. The other part that the tax I like to highlight is the 60% that you get on um, uh, exit is tax exempt. The 40% that goes to NVT is also tax exempt. The uniqueness of this is that whatever flows from NPS to the insurance company, because 40% is the minimum, you can put any amount to it. It is uh, exempt uh, from GST. So 1.8% is not applicable on the corpus that is being transferred from NPS to uh, insurance company to purchasing an NVT. Otherwise, when you purchase an NVT from an insurance company, 1.8% is uh, uh, right away deducted from your uh, fund that you transfer to the insurance company. Partial withdrawals we have, we allow three uh, times in a entire lifetime uh, that to some, for some reasons, but we discourage uh, partial withdrawals because it leads to the, the deductions or the accumulation of your uh, corpus. But these are also tax-free, but the uh, maximum amount that can be withdrawn is 25% of your own contribution, not the employer contribution. Apart from that, uh, the employer, if the employer contributes also, uh, that also is claimed as a deduction. But, but it's not treated as a perquisite. It will be treated as a perquisite and then allowed as a de deductions. So uh, from this current financial year, the entire thing has been capped. It was unlimited up to 10% of the basic and salary, the, uh, salary uh, of the salary that is basic and DA. But from this financial year, um, this is uh, 1st of April 20, uh, this has been capped to seven and a half lakhs all put together, superannuation fund, recognized provident fund and NPS. So apart from that, I just want to highlight one more fact of that is that uh, amount getting transferred from to superannuation fund to uh, a recognized provident fund to NPS, withdrawal is also exempt under tax. So that is uh, under uh, 1013 and under schedule of fourth schedule of the income tax uh, that for recognized provident fund, it is under the fourth schedule of part A under para 8. So that when you withdrawals from superannuation fund or recognized provident funds and transferring the money to NPS also is tax exempt, which we have allowed, in fact. 
for um, uh, transferring this uh, by individuals or by corporates to transfer uh, from superannuation funds to NPS. Coming to the last slide, I just uh, want to tell you about uh, the grievance redressal policy that we have uh, rolled out. We have a robust grievance redressal and it's a centralized grievance redressal mechanism, wherein all the any apprehensions of the system, any difficulties faced in the systems can be are addressed in the system itself. We have a matrix of uh, resolving it if the customer or the subscriber is not satisfied with it. We it's uh, first to the intermediary that is being concerned because we have a lot of uh, entities involved into these operations. Then we have NPS trust, then we have an ombudsman, we have the authority ourselves. Even if the subscriber is not satisfied with the resolution provided by the authority, it can be escalated to the securities appellate. So this is the journey of the entire NPS that I have to say. And uh, this was my last slide, in fact. And I'm open to questions after this. Sure. Uh, thank you, Monoji. Very detailed and uh, insightful. Um, we have uh, questions lined up. Uh, can I can I begin by taking the questions, reading out the questions for you? Yeah. Sure. So I would say aptly the first question is uh, from uh, Shruti, who asks, "What is the ideal age for starting investment in NPS?" It is uh, uh, the earlier you start, the better it is. Because the power of compounding all this we read comes when you, when you start early uh, planning it. The, at a younger age, you don't think of retirement. You're thinking of, of career growth and uh, working throughout your life and um, uh, till you are uh, having certain ambitions to cover up and all those things. But side by side, you need to do a retirement planning also. And the ideal age that I start is that whenever you start earning it, uh, because uh, you will stop working if you plan to stop working. So once you have joined and have a regular flow, it's something for retirement planning also. So once you start, immediately it is um, a personal recommendation. Right. Sure. Uh, I'll move on to the next question. I'd like to club these two questions. Yeah. So one question is from Mr. Rajiv who says, on a corpus, on a contribution is what he says, but I'm, I'm guessing he means the corpus. On a corpus of 10 lakhs, what kind of pension can one expect? And uh, the next question is for a, for a let's say, a 45-year-old, uh, if one were to expect a pension of about 20,000 per month, how much should one invest on a monthly basis? I mean, it's more mathematical, but yeah. See, the, 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 the simple calculation is, uh, the you go by the annuity rates. What is applicable at this? Because when, um, as I told you, there are uh, certain, uh, at, at the point of exit, you need to commit certain percentage of your corpus to the insurance company. Insurance company has annuity plans and the annuity rates. Annuity rates are nothing but what are the prevailing interest rates there are and they keep the margin onto it. The very simple is that what you earn on an, on an investment, you'll part, you can part only with that, keeping for the insurance company a certain percentage for their expenses. So if the current, now the annuity rates are around six, five and a half percent, when you, if you want the capital to be returned, five, five and a half percent. So when you say that I require a pension of uh, 20,000, so if you want the return of capital also, wait, I think you need to save around uh, uh, you need to give the insurance company around uh, black, that means annually you need to have around uh, 2 lakh 40,000. 2 lakh 40,000 should uh, bring you an, uh, 2 lakh 40,000 you, ne you need to have on annually. So 2 lakh 40,000 can be earned at only at the rate of 5% of what would be the corpus. So going by the annual rate, so you need to work it out. 50 lakhs, that's what. Uh, so it will be approximately because see the rates are in developed countries, the rates are going down only. It is not that uh, we of the 5% doesn't look good right now. But it, the future may be even worse than that 5%. So going 30 years down the line, if the annuity rates are around 4%, we require a higher corpus. And uh, 
definitely if we the economy progresses the rates are definitely going to come down in the future it's not going to rise right sure uh, we move on to the next question and there is a question on tier 2 um, for for people investing in tier 2 do they get indexation benefits no no we have been trying hard with the government we are trying to hard to convince the government that it works like the same as a mutual fund why don't you give us a indexation benefit or saying that uh, more like an equity oriented uh, long term capital gains and for that like equity oriented mutual funds where you can have 65% more so we have been pleading with the government and uh, government has not yet given a clear uh, means, uh, means parity with the mutual fund what is that that whatever gains is there no it will be added to the income right at present position so everything the entire gains that would be arising from the tier 2 is taxable will be added to your income and you'll be tax you should put in your tax as the at the marginal slab rate whatever you fall into 10 20 30 whatever it is right sure the next question uh, is from uh, mr santel who asks can an oci join or open an nps account yes yes you can join we have enabled it in fact recently we have enabled it it was not there previously ocis and pios were not allowed to join i think last year we have committed um, uh, it and we have got the fema also um, and amended to that extent by rbi saying that uh, the only catch here is that they have to buy buy the insurance from a indian company indian. and the nvt will be paid in indian rupees so that he has to transfer it to his nr nr nre account or nro account and then get it transferred it will be not be in foreign currency or anything like that it has to be an insurance company of india and the nvt also will be paid in indian rupees right uh, the next question is on charges um, atul asks if i contribute to my tier tier 2 account hmm. why is it that i have to pay a brokerage to the pop see the a uh, brokerage is something it's not a broker is see uh, the right. pop are the distribution channel in this entire architecture they are giving you the service of remitting the money in the system and then tracking uh, the flow of the money into the system also seeing that it is being properly credited to your to your account so this is the service charge they are charging it it's not a broker is see the bro the the at to itself the, the fund management charges is 0.01 and the brokerage is being whatever the security transactions in done the brokerage is borne by the fund manager it's not to the scheme also sure thank you uh, the next question amonoji is from mr shailesh who asks what is meant by annuity plan of insurance company that is in relation to 40% of annuity at the time of exit annuity plans are something like what has happened is annuity plans uh, what do you say that you put away with your money in the insurance company and they promise you regular income that is annuity so you say that i give you 1 lakh rupees in return they will say that okay monthly i'll give you this much so it is guaranteed till you leave basically that they, this is a pure annuity plan so till the person is alive the insurance company will pay you the committed amount or the guaranteed amount to that so this is the first type of pure annuity that is there and the other part is that the return of capital i give you 1 lakh you return me 1 lakh whatever interest i they earn they will see that to it and they say that okay i'll give you this much only of this interest if i earning 7% i'll give you say i'll commit to 6 and a half percent of it so this is what the return of capital on an annuity is annuity is a, as by definition is a regular income flow of income periodic flow of income sure sure um the next question is on asset allocation as in how many times can i um change asset allocation in a year and i'll i'd I'll, I'll like to club one more question are there any charges applicable when i change my fund manager and do these charges differ from fund manager to fund manager no what happens is that once you change your asset location uh, the only the cra transaction cost is there rupees 75 paisa per transaction and uh, when you execute the request through a pop that uh, 20 rupees charge is there so these are the two charges that will be there 
Apart from there, you can change uh, twice in a year, the asset allocation. Because once you change the asset allocation, um, one entry has to be made, which for which the record keeper charges you three rupees seventy-five paisa. And the other is that the request has to flow through the point of presence, that is um, uh, the, the channel of distribution, which is the interface between the system and you. So they will be they are entitled to charge you twenty. and this is across uniform across the fund manager does not charge anything he is only entitled to charge 0.01 on a daily basis of what he maintains what assets he is uh, managing so asset manager doesn't charge anything on to this sure. uh there is a subscriber rakesh who is of course congratulating uh, pfrd on allowing the uh, transfer of superannuation on the on the effort uh, in that on that front but then he also shares his concern that lic I mean, asking for exit loans. Uh, uh, See, this is a very good, uh, very complicated issue. What happens is that, no, the employer as a superannuation fund, as I told you, as a trust, they had outsourced the function to LIC. Now that contract has been done between LIC and the employer. That these are the terms of the contract. So they say normally say that when a person superannuates, I'll pay you this much. Now if somebody who goes out of the fund in between. i'll charge you this much so, mm. and these and insurance company is under the regulator of another basically irda so we don't have much say into it because it's an individual contract by an employer with another insurance company and the regulator is also different so we are aware of it the situation because yes this is uh, because it is governed by those terms of the contract we have nothing more much to say about it right right yeah sure um the next question uh, is from uh, yash he says what is the eligibility to transfer money from epfo to uh, nps uh, and epfo epfo has right now not allowed it there there's a requirement to the amendments of the epf that's what employees provident fund if if epfo is office it is not possible right now there are some amendments are required in the epf act Uh, corporate nps exemption is it over and above 1.5 lakhs under section 80c and the 50k tax benefit the tax benefits are applicable to an ssc it's nothing about to do whether you are tagged or not tagged the, the corporate tax benefit comes only when you only when the employer contributes right. so when the employer is contributing on your behalf what happens is that it added to the income under under section 70 and then you get a deduction And that is limited to ten percent. Now all three put together seven and a half lakhs. Superannuation fund, recognized provident fund, and NPS all club together seven and a half lakhs. So that is the limit to it. For other part of fifty thousand, it's available to any SSC. So under ATC, you can claim two lakhs deductions. And this fifty thousand is unique. No other in investment instrument has this. Sure. There is a question from Sachin. How is NPS different from Atal Pension Yojana? The Atal Pension Yojana is something where there is a guarantee to it. You the commitment is that the person on the age of sixty will get thousand rupees pension. That is guaranteed, and your contribution is also specified. So, person joining at eighteen years of age, and he wants to have a pension of thousand rupees at the age of sixty, he needs to contribute only forty two rupees. So so these two things are defined. Now, what this once you define the inflow and the outflow, that means somebody is guaranteeing to it. So the returns are guaranteed into it. The returns that are guaranteed by the government is eight percent, and the annuity that has been guaranteed is seven percent at sixty. So which is not the fact right now. We are earning more now, nine point nine and uh, nine point something. But the NVT rates as the prevailing rates, yes, yeah, the, the, the there is a shortfall of one and a half percent. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a question from uh, Mr. Rajesh. He says my NPS account was tagged to my company. Now that I am retired, uh, can I remove the tagging myself, or do I have to ask my company to do it? Uh, company has to the request has to flow from the company, uh, uh, the point of presence. 
so that uh, the detagging can be done better because the cor corporate will have access to the systems directly of the or through the pop so the instructions will follow from the company itself to detect that uh, the employee who has retired so he can continue on his own basically sure sure um what is the right strategy to invest i have invested all my money in government security funds can you suggest the right strategy to invest my money it's very difficult to suggest uh, because uh, you suggest on your own perspective of what your risk appetite is okay. so there it's it's basically uh, i can tell you about theoretically it's not about practicality so uh, theoretically what we say is that government funds and private funds the difference is that the government funds of the there's a equity cap of 15% so this the return that i've shown you for central government employees for a period of 12 years of 9.96 is capped with an equity component of 15% and the private funds yes uh, if you are talking about the fund managers there is no difference between the, they follow the same investment guidelines they are subject to the same supervisions and uh, they are being followed up and monitored in the same way there is no differentiation from the regulator's point of view being a private and a uh, government fund manager sure uh, what is the difference i think you have touched upon it but maybe briefly you could what is the difference in the employee pension scheme and uh, nps and what kind of interest can one earn and the taxability the employees epf when you are talking about epf is something different the you it's mandatory only if you draw 15000 and less and if you are working in an institution where it we have employees more than 20 these two things are not comparable to that extent because there there you have a element of guarantee also when you say that okay you complete 10 years 20 years of service you are entitled to this much you you whatever it is and the entire the only uh, difference between is that whatever the contributions that you make you can withdraw it 100 there is no invitation so you are on your own you do you, you 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 give the money and you get back the money the investment returns that are getting it's administered so the government the epfo declares the rate every uh, every year here the difference is that it's a market linked return and the experience of 12 years is that our returns the nps returns were higher than the administered returns and the last part is that see you your 12% is what you get other 12% that is being contributed it goes into two parts also one part three parts basically it goes to the provident fund it goes to the employees pension scheme and it goes to the employees deposit link insurance scheme also so that the employer 12% is split into three parts so your the pension that you get you will get only maximum of 7 and a half percent if you complete 35 years of service which is very rare in fact it's a very hypothetical situation that you get normally you get around a pension of around 5000 max to max so here your pension is not defined you define the pension in nps the way you accumulate the way you uh, contribute determines your pension sure so in the interest of time i'll take uh, two huh. more questions uh, right, right, right. Uh, is there any cap to invest to contribute to tier 1 that is that is if i no there is no cap the tax benefits are restricted to 10 10% there is no cap you can contribute any amount to it we are the system is ready to accept all the amount sure and uh, can i continue contributing post 60 Uh, or do i have to kind of opt for annuity compulsory no that, that's what i told no see after 60 years you have lot of options also i have shown you the normal options which are normal circumstances is there at 60 you can continue also until the age of 70 at 60 the other option is that you in the lump sum 60% and that too you can pay it at one go you can defer it in installments whatever installments you want 5 6 10 installments also you can take it You can defer your annuity by three years. 
you can just continue in the system the way you have been contributing and you can opt out any time you want before seven, before 70 sure. there are multiple options into it i think this question is more when you applicable when you kind of purchase annuity so, so someone asks if a pensioner does not renew yearly what will be the status of the plan renew you see we say that only we, we need to put 1000 rupees there is no renewal for us in 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 nps we say that the annual contribution should be 1000 if it's not contributed also there is no penalty to it the next year when you call, we, we what we do is that we freeze the account in the system if, you, if the contribution doesn't come because uh, with the freezing of an account your rates goes down because of your your cra charges goes down basically that's so because the account is not active so once you start contributing the next year it becomes again active there's no not, not, nothing required if the, if when you are talking about a pensioner renewal yearly it's a life certificate i think if, and the question is to, to be framed that way so that life certificate when you purchase an annuity scheme i think the life certificate can be given electronically also right now i think your flow will stop if you don't give a life certificate that your proof that you are still I think uh, we've covered most of the questions. The questions will keep coming in. Ah, uh, there you can take it. No issues. Yeah. No. So I, I would request uh, uh, if there are further questions, you could write to us at uh, NPS at Way to Wealth. I would request all the subscribers. I'm just um, sharing. So there's one. I extended my NPS account to the age of 65 with contributions. I'm 62 now. And retired. So, can I now go for withdrawal and close the account? Yes, that can be done. Ajis Punjani. Uh, one, I'm just saying that somebody has opened it to ENPS mm -hmm. and Senthil AV. Right. I think you need to submit a form or you do an e-sign. Yeah, I think Senthil can probably write to NPS at Way to Health and we can we can check with SDL on the status of the form and reply back to you on what needs to be done. Asset uh -huh. allocation, yes, twice in a year. Is there any? Yes, there is no limit to that. Sentinel only saying that. Okay. Sure. Hmm. I think Monoji, we've covered uh, yeah. almost all the questions. Yeah. <laughs> can we check the portfolio of under NPS? Yes. Um, I think uh, what has happened? No, we can uh, introduce the. Uh, we have a mobile app also. So the mobile app, uh, you need to give in a PRAN number. You can generate the password online also. The app is available from both the CRAs. So that is more handy to uh, see your account on the go. I think Vishal, can we check the portfolio under NPS? Portfolio mm -hmm. under NPS, if you want to check the fund manager portfolio, I think uh, uh, the fund managers declare the portfolio on their uh, website every month. And the NPS trust also declares uh, the top five holdings of each portfolio. I interested between government funds, what is the right strategy? Yeah, so I think we have done, right? Sir? Yes, oh, looks I like we've covered uh, most of the questions. I've also shared my our uh, NPS ID. So in case people have further queries, they could write into us. Right. So thank you. Uh, thank you all uh, for your uh, enthusiastic participation in today's webinar. Mono, sir, it was a pleasure to have you as the speaker for today's session. I'm sure all the participants who have joined have gained immensely uh, from this, uh, from the insights provided by you. We appreciate you taking time out, as always, of course, <laughs> the schedule to, to deliver this uh, session. 
Thank you very much. I also uh, would like to thank Mr. Sajish, Manager of PFRDA. Um, I would like to extend my gratitude to our uh, event partner, Blossom Advisors and Consultants, who have been helping us to conduct this webinar series. Thank you, Mr. Rajesh. Our uh, next webinar will be uh, in a fortnight from now. Uh, a link to the recording of this webinar, a feedback survey link, and the registration details for the next webinar will be mailed to each of the participants. Uh, thank you all. With that, we come to the end of uh, today's session. Uh, have a good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Manaji. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it.